Welcome to the Better Me, A Better You, A Better Us podcast series at the School of Dentistry here at the University of Leeds. I'm Tamora Shenwood and I'm the School Academic Lead for Inclusive Pedagogies, aka the SALIP, and today I'll be your host. Today I'm joined by our Head of School, Dr Alan Mile, and internationally renowned culture change advocate, Dr Simon Fleming. Together we'll be exploring bullying, harassment and undermining. Alan, Simon, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me and calling me internationally renowned. I'll take that. <laughs> uh, yeah, great to be here. Thank you very much. So let's start with some context. Alan, as head of school, why is the subject of bullying, harassment and undermining something that you want people in the dental school to be talking about? Yeah, I think this is very important that we do talk about this because the dental school is like so many organisations where there's a clear power hierarchy. We have students and most of our students are lay people who are transitioning into healthcare professionals for the first time. So that's a massive step in itself. Uh, and then we have more junior colleagues who clearly uh, are looking up towards their seniors uh, and people who are leading the fields and also actually leading the opportunities for them. So we're in a position where we have a lot of power dynamics. We have, by the nature of our business, a lot of assessments, and it's ensuring that the students um, feel that they are getting a fair deal when it comes to these issues, yeah. but equally uh, the staff too. And I think it's one of those things that you get into a position, into a culture where you just carry on, everyone is busy, and perhaps we don't always recognise that these things are going on yeah. because people don't feel empowered to speak up about them. So really important that we are talking about these, but sometimes I feel that I'm not even entirely cl clear what we're talking about when we say bullying, harassment and undermining. What's the difference and why does the difference matter? So, I, I mean, they're pretty emotive terms and people throw them around and there's a bunch of definitions in the literature, though Though the law doesn't really talk about bullying and undermining at all. If you, if you look at ACAS and all that sort of stuff, they kind of talk about it in the context of the stuff that's in the law. So they talk about being bullied in the context of, of discrimination or harassment, for example. When you talk about bullying, um, there's controversy around whether you can be bullied as a one-off or whether it has to be a repetitive thing. Okay. Um, so can you meet someone for the first time and they be a bully? Right. Or are they just being mean, but if they're mean all the time to you, then they're a bully? Um, there's stuff from, you know, organisational culture around it. There's stuff even from, if you look at uh, papers written by uh, people involved in uh, kind of childhood education, school education, um, where those power dynamics that, that you were talking about exist, but they're far more intangible, you know, whether you're a cool kid or not, whether you fit in or not, whether you look the same, sound the same, and so on. But my definition, the one that I, I gave my talk earlier today, and the one that I talk about the most, is, is fundamentally it comes down to power, whatever that power might be, financial, social, whatever, and silence, as in your ability to challenge and question and push back against that power. Um, so the example I always give is, you know, in a, in a clinical setting, is a clinician coming on to, uh, into a clinical space and going, you, Simon, come with me, I want you to do X. And I go, no, I'd rather not. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm on my, I'm in on my day off doing some admin, whatever. And they go, oh, fair enough, you don't have to do it, but aren't your appraisals coming up? Don't you have some assessments I need to sign? Right. Well, I guess I'll do what what you want me to do. Um, it, it is it is being made to do or not to do something because you don't feel that you can say no or that you can push back. Undermining is more nuanced, uh, and again, the literature talks about it being more of a a sense of being made to feel small or worthless or have less value. So the the joke I made today was, you know, back in my day, I did a proper dental degree. Yeah. Your Mickey Mouse GNVQ PBL based course isn't a real course. We had books in my day, but but undermining can be anything from. It's not that I don't like microaggressions, but they suggest a smallness to the impact that I don't think is fair. But 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 undermining can be anything from 
Oh, Alan, you know what women are like. Which is interesting because that, of course, then instantly crosses over into the harassment and dis discrimination language. Whereas if I say, oh, you know what dental students are like? Well, now, they're not a protected group, yeah. but I am implying that they're, they're less in some way. Oh, students nowadays, ugh. And then, and then you have undermining and harassment, which is easier in some ways to define because it's defined in law, but harder because the law very much talks about how that person feels. So you've got the nine protected characteristics, age, sex, gender, marital status, etc. Uh, and uh, discrimination is if you feel that you have been treated differently because of that characteristic. Uh, I'm Tamora, I feel I didn't get that job because I'm a woman. Yeah. Uh, and if you feel that way, and make something of it, then it is the duty of someone else to prove that it is not the case. I feel I've been, and this is where people get really heated about it, is because it's that whole thing of like, well, is it in the eye of the beholder? If you feel you've been discriminated against, but you haven't, and then you get into the myth of meritocracy and all that other stuff. And then you've got harassment, which is where you feel attacked or offended because of those things. So again, it's the, uh, the I hate the word banter, by the way, it's, synonymous with just being a bit of a knob but 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 the bullying to banter ratio yeah. where I say oh you you're upset but that's not my problem uh because I was just making a joke where you happen to be the punchline or your characteristics happen to be the punchline and and so again there's some real nuance around it because actually even though it's defined in in law because it comes down to how you feel uh there there's some real complex power dynamic based conversations about and of course the counter argument is you know if a tree falls in the woods and no one's there to hear it so if alan and i have a conversation and you're not in the room well you're not there to feel anything no ergo is our conversation still a problem right because we're just two men you know smoking cigars chatting about the problem with women and ethnic minorities in the workplace but fundamentally, it's clearly still both discriminatory and harassment in nature. And, and but, but what you need is for someone, a bystander, to go, that's a problem. And that's, again, why all the stuff we're doing and talking about and have been talking about is so important. Because it's about shining a light on these things that rely on no one ever raising concerns. And no one ever going, well, that's not quite right. That's not, that's not okay. Um, because that's what... That's what the law at least requires. But in, in real terms, you can't really change things unless people stick their head above the parapet and go, that's not all right. So that's actually a, a really interesting area because I mean, I'll be honest enough to say that I've definitely seen instances of undermining um, in the school, um, at the very least, and, and I have failed to act. Um, so what do we know about what needs to happen in in the individual and in the in the community that even when people are recognizing those neg negative behaviors why why do we fail to act because that, that's something that I've you know an active choice to do nothing uh the long answer and the short answer are quite different uh, the short answer is fear. Yep. Fear, but then the long answer is fear of dot, dot, dot. Um, uh, so uh, when you look at questionnaires where they say, why didn't you report X or why didn't you report Y? The most common answers that come out are, I didn't think it would make a difference. Okay. I didn't want to make a fuss or a non-British version thereof. Uh, and... I was afraid of or concerned that it would have consequences for me around my life, career, salary, world, because it's not unreasonable to expect people to be a bit selfish. And not in a bad way, not selfish in terms of like you're a terrible person, but you know, if you've got bills to pay or a course to pass or assessments to get signed off, it's not unreasonable for you to be like, yeah, I do have to look out for myself a little bit. Um, and it's really easy for people who are just covered in privilege to go, be brave. So what if you lose your job? Because they can say that because they'll walk into another job or they've got 
generational wealth, whatever it might be, that allows them to be brave in a way that other people can't be. Um, and 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 what you're describing about, you know, I, I witnessed it and I walked past it. I said today, you know, what you permit, you promote. Mm. But I think most people, if they're honest and, and imagine their life thus far, will think about the time that that person told a sexist joke. Yeah. And maybe they laughed, but not really heartily. Or maybe they kind of nodded along. And what you get is this kind of compound moral injury, this increasing sense of just being uneasy with yourself because you know that deep down you're doing things that don't sit right with you. You you, you have, uh, I, I said it earlier today, it's, it's those feelings of kind of shame and anger and guilt because you know that you've either walked past, physically walked past, or kind of metaphorically walked past. You've you've let certain things slide because you've gone, is it worth my time? Is it worth the hassle? Is it gonna make a difference? Am I just gonna make a lot of fuss, screw myself over for next year's appraisals or whatever, and not make a difference? And 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 there is a piece in in kind of the advocacy and allyship literature around picking your battles. Okay. So the other problem is, and I was talking about this recently at a this is unashamedly a humble brag, and a thing in Canada. Um, but we were talking about when you when you become someone who, this is what you do, like day in, day out, I'm an advocate, I'm an ally, like in a non-performative way, all you see is problems. All day, everywhere. You're like, that's not all right, that's not all right, that's not all right. And you do then go, right, I've got to pick my battles because otherwise all I'm going to be doing is be that guy who's like, stop, you are saying or doing something that's not okay. And it's exhausting and isolating. And it becomes, it's also easier to ignore you yeah, because you just become that, that white noise machine in the background continuously, you know, shouting into the void. So part of it as well is re- recognising that people walk past things just because they're like, I've got other battles to fight. I think you're absolutely spot on there. It's about what is the threshold that you should act. And, of course, that's a very complex uh, situation, full stop. I suppose one of the potential places it could happen in somewhere like a dental school is when feedback is being given. So by the very nature of our clinical courses, um, it is the student who is the operator delivering the care, uh, and they are supervised by a GDC registrant and I suppose you know it it then becomes is it the nature of the feedback that's one example Um, is that actually undermining or is it being done in a constructive way and of course that's invariably being done in front of a patient um, and in front of the wider team and I think that's sometimes where in the high pressure sort of uh, the highly charged situation of of clinic um, the threshold perhaps again changes I, and I, I love that as an example. So when I, I started this ages ago, that was one of the most common pushbacks I got from more senior clinicians is, oh, I can't give negative feedback now because I'm a bully. And they're not all mutually exclusive. So you can have negative feedback and be a bully. You can have negative feedback and not be a bully. You can give positive feedback and be being kind. You can be give positive feedback and still sort of be being, you know, so if I say to you, um, Alan, you know, for a white guy, that was an, Excellent, excellent job you did there. Really well done. I, wait, what? I, <laughs> so that was good. Wait, I, and 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 I, I'm very open to say that I am. Um, I once raised concerns about a trainee. I'm a trainee myself, and the trainee's counterpoint was, um, Simon doesn't like me. Simon's a bully. His his concerns are uh, are invalid. I want to raise a, like a countersuit. And so I was taken to one side and said, well, Simon, you've been accused of bullying. And I said, no, okay, Um, crikey. Well, I guess we should probably look into both those things then. And they were like, "Uh, what? And I was like, well, um, I think that that trainee X is problematic and they think that I'm a bully. And both of those things can be true. Um, Shouldn't we look at both of us? And they were like, we'd rather not. Um, could, Could you just... They've said that they'll withdraw their bullying complaint if you withdraw their training and difficulty complaint. So can you just do that? And I was like, no, no, I don't think I will. And they're like, well, we've done it for you. It's done. I was like, oh, fine. And and that's the classic example. So um, 
I'm sure you can think of excellent trainers whose behaviours maybe do not align with university values. Yeah. You would hope, you would hope that those trainers, if taken to one side and sat down and spoken to with respect and trained appropriately, would modify those behaviours. Because fundamentally, if you're a good trainer but a bad person, I'm still not sure I want you training. Which is a difficult thing to to enact on because it's hard enough to find trainers and then hard enough again to find good trainers. But if you're a great trainer but a bully, I would argue that you're therefore by definition a bad trainer. And and that kind of narrative of oh you know you know what he's like, oh he's great but he does say those things, uh, and I am gendering those people because more commonly it does tend to be men but but fundamentally if you are seen to be a great trainer because I know you let people do lots or you give them loads of autonomy or whatever but you're a bully or you're a sexist or a racist or a homophobe or you have wandering hands or whatever it might be that is your characteristic that's not acceptable yeah. then in my mind you are in fact a bad trainer and therefore the fact that the trainee a certain cohort of trainees like you doesn't excuse those behaviours and I would hope that if someone took me to one side and said, Simon, the trainees love you, but I, I'd hope that that but would have me sit down and go, yeah, tell me. Not, well, I've been doing this for 20 years. And I've never had any complaints. Because most of the people who've never had any complaints, never had any complaints, it's because people are afraid of them. I, I don't buy that you can have been, had 20 years of flawless practice. I don't, I don't, I don't believe it. Mm. So in in terms, uh, that's really interesting. In terms of going back to undermining, so if a staff member is feeling undermined themselves, is there any evidence to suggest that their behaviour will be undermining of others? So evidence-wise, it's, it's that kind of circle of abuse thing. So part of it is, um, you, you know, that I, I'm trying to remember the exact quote, but it, it's like, you know, if you went through an abusive time and think that it, it didn't do you any harm that in and of itself is a red flag. Mm. Um, and and again, we spoke earlier about the, the Vanderbilt cup of coffee, which is where you, you have kind of uh, reflective conversations with people to feed back to them. And, and a lot of undermining is unintentional or couched in your own insecurities and your own what have you. And, and often it just requires a little bit of gentle feedback, either from a peer-to-peer -peer or near-to-peer -peer situation. Because even my most open-minded uh, colleagues say that they find it difficult having a medical student tell them certain difficult things. It's hard, it's hard not to find that difficult. So, so we know that if, if you are undermined, you are likely to um, obsess about that, especially over the day. We know that you are likely to be uh, less good at your job that day, make more mistakes, less likely to help others, less likely to go the extra mile. Uh, and about 25% of people who've experienced a behaviour like that will take it out on a patient. Now, what that taking it out on a patient looks like is up for debate because it may be something obvious. So someone makes a joke about me being an orthopod and being, you know, a knuckle dragger who can't, you know, whatever, make that kind of humour, right? But for whatever reason, it, it hits home. Now, me taking it out on a patient is unlikely to be me you know, throwing a scalpel at a patient across a room, it's more likely to be me rushing their consultation, me missing that mm. that pregnant pause in their history that normally I'd go, is there something more you want to say? It, it might be that they go, could I see you again in four months? And I go, no, I'm discharging you because I just want done with them because my mind is elsewhere. But what we know is that these behaviours, small though they may seem, have exponentially larger impact on our behaviours uh, and how we interact with our patients. And that's the bit that I think changes the minds of some of the people who think a lot of this is kind of wishy-washy, snowflakey silliness, is you go, whether you like it or not, the stuff we're talking about has been shown to harm patients. I, I said it today, you read the review about Midstaffs or Bristol or the recent, look, they looked at Great Ormond Street, whenever they look at one of those units that has had problems, in that first paragraph, they they use the phrase toxic culture. Uh, Birmingham at the moment is having similar problems. Uh, unashamedly, 
the words toxic and culture feature in those first five or six lines. And it's and when you ask people, they say, yeah, there's just it's just a feeling of this. I don't feel safe. I don't feel relaxed. I've got that continuous nervous energy. I'm always wary that when when someone says, good job, what's unspoken is good job for a or or for you or book for someone who looks like you or sounds like you or behaves like you or trained where you trained or whatever. So even that, you can imagine how that's going to put you off your stride if you're in a high stress, high demand job like healthcare. You, you you mentioned the word snowflake, and yeah. I always think that's a, a very contentious term myself. Is it more a case of our culture allows people to speak up more now? Because um, I'm, I'm not convinced that people are any less resilient now uh, than they were, say, 10 years ago, 20 years, 50 years ago. Because it seems, you know, the, 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 I suppose every era has its own challenges, but life isn't necessarily getting any easier but I see plenty of people who are prepared to step up and stand up um, and go the extra mile. I mean, this is a pod- podcast, so people can't see me smiling because you said like a bunch of, of words that just are like the little red flag to the bull bit. So I love this. So number one, snowflake. My favourite snowflake quote, quote is, yeah, fine, I'm a snowflake, but you have enough snowflakes and you have an avalanche. And, and that is the Black Lives Matter movement. That was Me Too in Hollywood. That was... One person going, isn't he a sexual predator? And everyone going, shut up. And then a load of people going, no, I'm pretty sure he's a sexual predator. And everyone going, oh. And and it's interesting. You're, you're right in that every generation tends to look at the generation that went before and went, oh, God, they're just so dated. And, and it, it will happen to me. It, it happens to all of us. It is the nature of life. The point is, if you have a growth mindset, you welcome it. You look forward to the day where someone goes... We've changed for the better. You up for it? And a growth mindset goes, I don't understand why, tell me more. I don't understand why, tell me more again. And either you get it or you go, I don't get it. I guess I'm done. And and the resilience narrative is is fascinating. So unashamedly, my my missus is doing a PhD on, on resilience in surgeons. That's her thing. So uh, most of my knowledge around resilience has been through osmosis from being around much smarter people. Um, but but the narrative I love is that most of the resilience work came from the military. And there's this idea that you're in your base and you're in your safe, and I, I use that word, your safe community, right? These are your people. This is your safe space. Cup of tea, supportive, supportive community who welcome you and help you reset and bounce back and recover. And then you go out. You go out and you do and you see and you are involved in traumatic and difficult things, right? You are under fire. And then you return to base and you recover and you bounce back. And that's that principle. So you take that principle and then you say, right, uh, Alan, have you ever run a marathon? Uh, And I'd like you to knock two minutes off your time because I think you've got it in you to knock two minutes off your time and I'm going to send you on some courses and I'm going to, we're going to explore your nutrition and everything. And you go, all right, fair enough. And so you've got to imagine that you go up that graph and then you add that little bit more. And then I turn around to Mo Farah. I say, Mo, I'm going to knock two minutes off your time. And Mo goes, that's not humanly possible. I'd have to be in a car to do that. Uh, if I can knock 0.2 of a second off my time, I'm, again, the fastest man in the world. And that's the resilience narrative around healthcare professionals. People say, oh, you need to be more resilient. And actually, a lot of the data shows that we are, quote, unquote, less resilient than the general population. Because we're already working at the other end of the graph. So actually, our ability, our bounce back to trauma graph is much smaller because our day-to-day, our normal, is stuff that is already above and beyond. So when people say, oh, well, trainees nowadays, doctors nowadays, dentists nowadays, they need to toughen up, you go, I'm sorry, I I think you'll find I just worked a pandemic Uh, every day. Uh, I remember at the beginning of the pandemic being told that the chances of us catching COVID and having severe consequences were 10 to 20%. And they said, which is about the same kind of briefing we give to the people who go out and deal with IEDs and stuff in Afghanistan. And we were like, you what? 
Pardon? Can I have a, more masks? Please? And, and, and so the, the resilience narrative, that kind of you need to toughen up thing, A, comes from a fundamental lack of understanding of what resilience means and is, and B, a lack of understanding of what it is to be a healthcare provider in a modern healthcare service. When your your normal day, your return to base, is not particularly safe, not particularly relaxing. And so what has happened is over time, and especially over the, the pandemic, and, and we saw it today in some of the talks from the amazing dental students here, was actually people going, the pandemic has given me a little bit more bandwidth in this aspect of my life because I can't leave the house, yeah. um, which has given me time to raise some of these concerns that have probably been there since day one around racism, for example. And, and so what I'm enjoying seeing is the culture now has moved on to a place where it's not that it's necessarily psychologically safer to raise these concerns. It's just that people's threshold for moral injury has shifted, where they're like, I can't and won't live with these feelings of shame, anger, whatever they may be. But I, I sleep better at night. I sleep better at night doing X or Y and Z because the consequences are still there. I've been doing this gig now for nearly 10 years and I still get threats on my career. I still get threats to all kinds of stuff. I, I recently uh, had a child and I said, the reason I, my kid doesn't feature on social media is the number of people who just send me messages being like, I hope one day you and yours get cancer and you're too busy telling us that we should all be nice to each other. I'm like, mm, okay, fine. Um, and so that whole idea about the, the, this generation being kind of snowflakey and lacking resilience is literally the opposite. In fact, they are so toughened to all these things that, that if they say something's wrong, you really have to listen because they are so trained to, to take the hits and, and roll with the punches that if they're saying, look, this really doesn't sit easy with me, there's something there. There's something that's important. Um, and, 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 and it, again, it's nothing new. It's nothing new. Every generation has had their group of people who have stood up and said no more. It's just that through things like social media, it's possible to engage more people in the conversation at any one time. Yeah, that's. A, you know, I'm glad you've touched on social media because, yeah, and, and also the generation thing, because I can see as I have got older how the culture of my generation is very different from the culture of a generation who are 10 years younger or, or 20 years younger. And, of course, our students are... Uh, even younger still, and I just couldn't imagine growing up in a culture with social media in the way that it operates. And I do wonder sometimes within a peer group how much undermining goes on, for example, within that group, and whether I recognise that and how much that contributes to the overall piece. And I guess at the end of the day, people are people, aren't they? Uh, you, by their very nature, you're going to get some who, who might be more likely to undermine than than others uh, but the generation piece for sure yeah social media is a resource like anything else you know um th there were that there, there were pieces published about how tv was going to be the death of the printed word and how radio was going to be the te the death of the newspaper and and social media is is a thing nothing more it's a supplement it can be used for good or evil social media yeah. is is how me too and how black lives matter mm. came about mm. um it is also where people can be undermined and bullied and attacked and we see that and the communities that are built up there can be either extremely positive or extremely negative we're seeing what's an example we're seeing huge amounts of um uh, body dysmorphia because a lot of the influencers who are making a lot of money uh, by saying this is how you get fit are on huge amounts of gear. They're all using, not all, that's not fair, and I'll end up getting done for slander or something. Uh, a large number of them are on testosterone and growth hormone and steroids, and they're saying, but if you buy my, you know, if you don't work out and eat how I eat, then you'll be fat and unhappy forever. Now, those people used to exist in magazines. Now they can just access more people. Yeah. Um, but the power of social media is it's allowed those conversations to happen in a way that in a flattened hierarchy that no one could before because someone with a, a Twitter account or an Instagram account or a TikTok account can challenge a professor or a boss or a society or a culture 
And they may be shouting into the void, but also they may be heard. The flip side being it allows people with toxic views. And uh, last week, last week I received a DM saying, come the next Nuremberg trials, I'd be one of the first on the... And you're like, okay, fine, good. Because I basically said you should probably get vaccinated. Like, and good, fine, you think I should be hung. Mm. Wonderful, good for you. Um, but but it's it started these these nuanced conversations and one of the best pieces of true allyship is about amplifying voices that haven't or aren't heard. And there's a quote around uh, rape culture that says, uh, who is heard and who is not heard maintains the status quo. And so a classic example of that is um, my dad, who's no longer with us, but he used to speak eight or nine languages and he lived all over the world. And so he used to love to ask people, where are you from? And I and my sister had to sit that down and explain that depending on the way he did it, it either sounded like an old Australian man curious about where someone had come from, or it sounded super racist and all a bit you kippy. <laughs> And, um, and we had to unpack that for him. And he was like, no, I'm just interested in people. Because people would say, you know, oh, you won't know it. I'm from this small village in the north of Ukraine. And dad would start speaking Ukrainian. And they'd go, uh, what? <laughs> and oh, they'd go, oh, well, actually, I'm from this this small island off Thailand. And he'd go, I lived there for three years. And they go, oh, what? Um, and he would love that. He was a GP. He loved learning about people. But he couldn't understand why half the people he asked would get really angry and then not serve him in the restaurant anymore. He couldn't understand why that was a problem. And it took us really sitting down with him and going, can you see why that might come across? And it took, it was like a proper afternoon at home, stressful hair pulling out. <laughs> but, but, and it got to the point of just like, this is actually just how it is, Dad. So Dad was a, a Holocaust survivor. And we were like, if I just say to you certain things about, and he's like, no, the Holo this is just how it was. And I'm like, right. I'm just telling you how it is. And he was like, right. So I shouldn't say, where are you from? I might say, that's an amazing accent. I've traveled widely. What what part? Of, there are ways of unpacking that. And he was like, oh, right. And, and in a clinical setting, you know, um, I had a boss, a, a case was put up in, in a multidisciplinary team meeting. And he told me to man the F up. And I said, okie dokie. And afterwards I sat him down and I said, I don't think that was particularly helpful. It kind of made me feel pretty crappy about myself because I'd said I wasn't sure I could do it and you told me to man up. And he was like, well, Simon, I've got faith in you. I know you can do it. And you just need a bit of a push and to know that I've got your back. And I was like, well, why don't you say that then? And he was like, I don't know. It was nearly 8.30, it was time to go. I was like, no, I know, but what came out of your mouth made me feel crappy, and what you've just said makes me feel good. One makes me think I can do the case, one makes me want to go home. And he was like, ugh. And I was like, yeah, but still. And, and, and he kind of sat there, and you could see the cogs turning, and he was like, yeah, I, I guess it would have taken an extra 20 or 30 seconds, but I could see how one makes you feel small, and one actually makes you feel entrusted. And I was like, yeah, but they are, they're, they're the same conversation, but they have really different outcomes. And, and social media has done that. Social media has unpacked those little things that before kind of went unsaid or were said in corridors or in messes or in bars or in coffee shops. But the people who needed to hear them never heard them because they're not in those places. And now, luckily or otherwise, the people who need to be hearing these things are often on those platforms. And if not, the people who speak to them are. Yeah, that, that, that's really interesting, and it's sort of highlighted the complexity, uh, and I guess it's only going to become more complex. Just, just thinking back pre-social media um, is around patience, and I think one of the biggest challenges I find is if we have patients who say something or act inappropriately or what might be considered inappropriately uh, in a clinical setting, and experienced members of staff have ways of dealing with that. Um, but because I think our students who are there actually delivering the care, which in itself is immensely challenging and stressful or, or can be at times, uh, they can find themselves in difficult situations. Um, and sometimes those aren't witnessed by anyone else. And I'm not sure there's a simple answer to that other than raising the awareness 
of the importance of these issues uh, with our students and, and staff as they develop. Um, but I don't know if you've come across anything like that at all. So I, it's not I disagree with you. I, I think you can teach students um, the skills to challenge patients. So I remember being an undergrad and being told, um, you know, you must never upset patients. Like, oh, if you upset the patient in the OSCE, oh. Um, it was kind of correlated with causing unnecessary harm or unnecessary pain. And I remember doing a comm skills station. I train at Barts in London. I remember doing a comm skills station. It was one of those ones where you're filmed and the actor was feigning racism, racist views. And I was doing uh, what you're doing right now, uh, the kind of nodding along thing. Mm. Which you're taught to do in comm skills. It's just yeah. right, it's kind of mirroring. And um and afterwards, you know, the patient's going, Oh, I just want a doctor who sounds like me. Oh, yeah, I can't understand these accents, you know what they're like, right? And you're going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They go, Oh, and it it makes me feel like I'm not listened to. If I don't think I can understand them, maybe they can't understand me. And you're going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They go, so if it's all right, I'll just have white doctors from now on. And you go, mm-hmm, yeah, okay, fine. Yeah. And then you watch the video back and the comm skill tutor was like, so you spent 10 minutes basically agreeing with what was for at least six or seven minutes, just a racist diatribe. And I was like, oh my God. And and we, and we and so this came out more recently uh, where a certain number, and it was in the press about patients asking for, for doctors in particular of a particular ethnic group. And there is guidance on this and we don't, we don't make staff and we don't make students aware of it enough. And again, more importantly, when they raise concerns, we don't back them enough. And what it comes down to is this. If you have a life or limb threatening condition, if you have a pathology that alters your behavior in some way, that's sort of a get out of jail free card for that episode, right? It is It is understandable. Uh, not understandable, it's forgivable, I guess, if you are have just been run over and stabbed and shot and whatever, that some of the stuff you say may not be you at your best. Uh, equally, if you are, if you have uh, delirium and are acutely septic and, 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 and. Um, also, there's, an, there's suggestions that if you're having intimate examination, you should be allowed to say, I would like the, the person examining me to be X or Y. Beyond that, there is no place for it. The end. Thanks for playing. And patients deserve, I think, the same chance to grow and change as we do. So I've had patients where they said, I will only see a doctor of this sex or gender or ethnicity or uh, sexuality. And I've taken the time to have a conversation with them. And either they've gone, I, I didn't understand, I'm really sorry, of course, I'm happy for X, Y, Z. And hopefully you've changed their worldview a little bit. Equally, I have asked some patients to leave and sent them away. You can't do that. I'm sick. Well, you are not dead. You are not dying. You are not in a life or limb threatening condition. Uh, and what you're saying is fundamentally discrimination, harassment, whatever. Thanks for playing. Now, what's interesting is there have been places where I've done that and been really well supported. And there have been places where I've done that where I have been taken to one side and told that is not acceptable. And I'm like, but it is. And I personally think that we need to move away from patient-centered care and move towards people-centered care. And it comes back to the resilience thing, right? Mm. Having the patient at the center of everything we do is wonderful and good and right. But the idea that we should set ourselves on fire to keep other people warm is, is flawed. So the, the idea that our students should be trained to take abuse or walk past abuse or not challenge abuse for fear of upsetting a patient is also flawed. Sometimes patients are wrong. Sometimes they're racist. Sometimes they are sexist or homophobic or whatever. And um, I believe that unless you're life or limb or the things I, I described, I think we should train our our students to be active bystanders. And if they don't feel safe, which is not unreasonable to go, hi there, I'm a you know second year dental student and I'm gonna raise concerns about you. They should be trained on how to escalate it to the right people. And then, and this is where it comes back to you both, they should then see stuff happen. 
So where I'm working at the moment, I was recently told their red card system's gone because they were red carding so many people and it became really hard to to maintain and security are like, you know, do not serve this people. That, but, but fundamentally, if we teach our students that raising concerns doesn't work, we can't then be surprised that they don't raise concerns. And patients need to learn that they are so lucky to have the healthcare service we have, but that we're not doctors, nurses, dentists, hygienists, admin staff, everyone and anyone who works in healthcare. We're not just there to be abused and we have to take it because of some Hippocratic oath silliness. And actually I think you can teach students active bystander skills and advocacy skills so that when a patient behaves in a way that's not okay, they know what to do. And sometimes it is just phone a friend. And sometimes it's, I'm really sorry, uh, Mrs. Smith, but we don't we don't say that anymore. Oh, well, I no harm meant by it. I'm, I'm sure there wasn't. I'm sure there wasn't. I'm just saying, we don't say that anymore. So I, I would really appreciate it if you didn't. All right. And most of the time, that's the response you get. Okie dokie. And they don't. And problem solved. But if they persist in these behaviours, there are consequences. And and not everyone shares that view, I should add. But for me, I think we have a privilege in healthcare whereby we say things and people listen. So if your patient is showing these behaviours, I think part of your role is a little bit of advocacy. So certainly a, a common theme uh, th throughout here really has been about empowering people to speak up about these issues, isn't it? And to empower people, we have to equip them with the skills to do that as well, support their development and uh, give them the confidence, the safe environment in which to do that. And I think that's, that's our job and part of that uh, work is starting here today with just as being in the room and having this conversation. So this has been really interesting. So thank you both so much for uh, for joining us. Um, and we'll speak to you again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you.